GIAR, uh, IRI, IMWI and World Fish. Uh, so we're very pleased to see you all today. Uh, the, the, what I've just put up on the on the slide is, is what we want, hope to cover in the next couple of hours. It, it, we've uh, deliberately uh, asked the conference organizers for an interactive session. Um, so what we want to try and do, as I say, is to <clears throat> Uh, initially sort of outline what we want to get from this, this session in terms of um, looking towards sustainable Delta futures. Um, we'll have a series of introduction talks, one for myself and one from Oli Sander, who's uh, heading up the, um, the, the team from the 2, 2DI um, uh, team today. Uh, we'll have a small uh, multimedia presentation to give some voices from the Deltas, because this is extremely important to us in terms of uh, any sort of sustainable Delta futures, how do we give, get voices uh, to the Delta communities? And, and obviously, even in a situation like this, where um, we're, try we're trying to make the, the Gaveshina conference as online and as accessible as possible, there are naturally accessibility issues. So we want these voices at the, at the very outset to sort of set some, set, set some scene and background. And then, uh, although one of our speakers has not appeared just yet, we have uh, two talks uh, from, from colleagues, one from each, each of our areas, uh, Michi, uh, Michi, Michito Katagami, Katagami uh, from the Asian Development Bank will speak on the uh, engagement in Asian deltas, and Pradeep Kuru Kular Saria, uh, hopefully he'll come along, uh, will talk about UNDP's approach to how we can get roadmaps to policy. And then we'll enter the interesting part of the session where we break out. And what we want to do is to, is to try and do this in, in two, two sort of uh, approaches. Firstly, to look at livelihood, coping strategies and resilience ordered oriented priorities for, for Delta dwellers, and then to look at the policymakers aspect of that too. And then in the plenary discussion feedback session, to look at what are the overlaps that offer sort of opportunity for collaborative approaches, to look at knowledge gaps and evidence bases, to look towards policy. And then in terms of next steps, uh, COP26 is going to occur in November this year, probably in a similar format than as Gobeshina. Uh, and so what we want to do is, is begin to start a discussion as to what we might do as a Delta's collective uh, towards COP26. So both Oli and I are going to outline sort of our, our, our organizations, let's call it that, our, 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 our hubs. I'm going to give you an introduction now, just for, for uh, just under ten minutes, hopefully, to the to the Living Deltas Hub, uh, and and, uh, and and what we are trying to to do and establish within within the Delta regions. Uh, in common with the Two Di initiative, we are addressing the fact that Delta dwellers face challenges across a range of scales, rapidly growing spatial scales of threat, and rapidly diminishing time scales in which to do anything about it. Uh, this diagram just shows the processes that occur in deltas on, on the left of that diagram with the green headers, global scale catchment and delta scale, in terms of sedimentation, climate drivers, hydrology, sediment loads and flows, influence of weather and climate. And on the right of that diagram are the sorts of impacts, not totally sort of um, comprehensive necessarily, um, that are affecting deltas on, again, those scales. So we are seeing wider climate change, biodiversity loss, and sea level rise. And we know, for example, in the Bay of Bengal, those rates of relevant, relative sea level rise are amongst the highest on the planet. On the catchment scale, we are seeing influences on deltas from uh, transboundary effects like damming and river regulation, changes in terms of land use and, uh, and aspects of changes in weather, which are affecting flood and drought. And we are also seeing loss of natural cultural heritage. And then on the delta scale, there's a whole host of implications of these changes ranging from agri-food system change, uh, uh, groundwater extraction, sail and intrusion, plastic pollution, deforestation, etc. And key to all of that, again, from our point of view as a hub, is this loss of or, or, or alteration of natural cultural heritage and how that affects communities' coping strategies and adaptation uh, strategies as well. If we think about how we want to approach uh, managing these sorts of large-scale areas are, are a range of approaches that we can do. We can, we can carry out precautionary approaches where we sort of, for example, might want to protect environments. For example, there's uh, proposals for large-scale seawalls in, in, in Bangladesh. This is already happening in China. Um, channelization and dredging are ubiquitous. Tidal resource management is also an, an aspect, but that also always 
doesn't always um, result in the right uh, outcomes. Manager adaptive approaches are, are, are more popular at the moment in terms of perhaps nature-based solutions, mangrove restoration, etc. These are often small scale, localized, and fit in with the level of acceptable risk that is tolerated. And as, as we see in this diagram, the cautionary approaches tend to be single intervention points, manage risk over the whole life of a scheme. But the advantage of managed adaptive approaches, which we uh, advocate in the hub, are that we can use a range of different interventions over time, developing the evidence for these as we go to manage that risk. The issue is that that green line is moving. Uh, the probability of risk is rising rapidly. The freedom of choices and the time available for both types of those approaches are rapidly diminishing due to the pace of climate change. This is complicated in across the world by geopolitics, but the often unasked questions are, are those of whether approaches are locally relevant and will be taken up. So our hub's complex development challenge is to try and address accelerating delta deterioration in South and Southeast Asia where we see that uh, deltas are moving from the Holocene Delta situation, as we might see in the top of the diagram, as human influence increases and dominant human control, then we have moved towards Anthropocene Delta social ecological systems, where Delta systems are completely altered. Where we don't want to be is in the red area on that graph. And so for Anthropocene Deltas, we need to begin to understand better. And what we want to understand today are perhaps some other threats, but particularly what are the priorities on deltas in terms of delta dwellers and their, and their hopes, aspirations for the future? What are the data gaps that we need to look at filling out information on those priorities? What are capacity gaps and incentives towards sustainability? How can we co-create opportunities through uh, evidence-based building, but also policy development to address coping strategies and adaptation strategies in deltas? And how can we incorporate natural cultural heritage into this story. From our point of view as a Delta, uh, Living Deltas Hub, we're working in uh, four social ecological systems spread across three nations. In, the, in Vietnam, we're working on the Red River Delta and the Mekong River Delta. And in Bangladesh and India, we're working on the Ganges Brahmaputra Magna system, which is, which is now divided between the two, but it is after all one ecosystem. And in terms of understanding Delta Nation challenges and priorities, we are looking towards more resilience oriented solutions and outcomes. So the questions we're asking are how are Deltas changing or what are the key drivers and consequences of that? How do we learn from previous experience to build better Anthropocenes for Delta dwellers? How particularly with an SDG agenda in mind, do we maximize capacity building to ensure no one is left behind? And how do we address infrastructure inequality and resilience through the policy arena? Those are four key questions within our hub. And that's important when we see that the bigger global agendas, whether Biden enters the Paris Agreement again tomorrow is neither here nor there, they are all struggling for traction. This is a potential disaster for Delta Futures. And so we're seeing that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is losing traction in the environmental goals. The Paris Agreement, well, we all know the implication, the, 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 the problems that's occurred, seen over the last particularly four years, but, but in general, to strengthen global response to climate change, we know that things are accelerating. And again, we have other framework, frameworks like the Sendai Framework for dis Disaster Risk Reduction. But the problem is that if, if we take this view of the SDGs from the SEI um, uh, model, uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center model, sorry, we're seeing that Delta biospheres are degraded. They nest unsustainable and waste wasteful economies. Societies are essentially inequitable and there are missing partnerships. And so in part, terms of partnerships, our hub is looking to seek for balance between our hub research community, balancing social sciences, arts and humanities and the earth sciences with a natural cultural heritage focus, with engagement with Delta dwellers and policy makers alike to bring locally rooted knowledge into policy, to engage with participatory research and co-creation, to share data as early as we can with policymakers and deliver gap analyses so that we can build more appropriate um, policy for the future for, towards transformation. And if we want to do that transformation, we have to accept that, to, to realize that resilient deltas should be able to cope with disturbances. They need to be able to maintain their essential functions and they must not limit long-term prospects for those who live on them. And that needs, in turn, better understanding of trends 
changes and risks and strategic planning and new ways of adapting to disturbance. And so in Living Deltas, we seek to turn the Stockholm Resilience Centre diagram on its head and begin with the partnerships to enhance regional collaborations. In turn, that we hope will lead to more resource efficient and circular economies, more equitable representation across sectors of society, and ultimately more resilient Delta biospheres. In practice, that might look like some, something like this. So where we have a partnership approach to protection, then we need to look at things like creation of essential market chain linkages with a focus on the rural poor, for example, creation of local greener business opportunities, opportunities for income generation, and again, with the SDGs in mind, to protect ecosystems, to learn through the establishment of baselines how systems are changing and to monitor better. And the outcome of that in terms of policy will, will be longer term evidence-based policy towards climate change mitigation, etc. So that's what we seek. But we have those knowledge gaps and what we are doing as a hub with over 100 researchers is working in a range of different areas. This diagram I'm not going to dwell on, but it shows that we work in 16 specific areas, but we work with six main academic work packages looking at SDG monitoring, behavior and risk, baselines, coastal systems, etc. We have over 100 researchers. We have a wide range of previous Delta Consortia leadership within the hub. It is a hub and therefore we seek significant interaction with partners towards our aims. And that's important when we see that 2020 was a particular year as we know of global challenge. And that challenge is, is going to have long-term impacts. Discussions even on the news today is about inequitable rollout of vaccines between rich and poor nations. But we know that the impacts of COVID were felt unequally across the globe and that the SDG agenda while it's struggling for attraction, it has also been affected across the piece. These are just some examples from a UN uh, publication looking at the way COVID has affected a range of SDGs. But in our areas where we work, in our social ecological systems, we also know that the effects of COVID-19 lockdown were inequitably felt. So various poorer sectors of society essentially went through the life savings in a short period of time. And then add on that climate extremes like Cyclone Umfum, and Cyclone Bulbul just before COVID broke out, and we can see that there are a cocktail of issues facing these societies. And so through discussion today, what we really want to find out as a hub are, are really a number of questions. What are the aspirations, hopes and fears of Delta dwellers for the future? We talk more today about the key priorities, both for Delta dwellers and for policymakers in the region. And from that, can we begin to unpick pieces, uh, uh, knowledge about what are the opportunities for enhancing mega delta resilience, but also what are the knowledge gaps and constraints affecting that too. And again, just an advert at the point, bottom there, if you want to follow us, go on our, web, web, our website and you can always follow us through our newsletter. I'll hand over now to Ole. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andy. Let me also share my screen now. And please let me know if you don't see anything. Otherwise, I think everything's fine. Okay, so good evening from uh, Vietnam. My name is Ole Sander. I'm uh, with the International Rice Research Institute. <clears throat> I'm the climate change focal point of Erie, and uh, I'm also coordinating uh, this climate change program focusing on securing the Asian mega deltas against sea level rise, flooding and salinization, which is a, a sub program of a new CGIR climate change program, which I will uh, elucidate a little bit more in uh, the coming minutes. And I have to uh, say first, we are still in the development of the program. So uh, Bear with me if I don't, uh, if I cannot share many of our results. So a brief uh, history, the two degree initiative. Uh, it started uh, in early 2019 when we uh, started conceptualizing uh, the new, a new CGIR climate change initiative. And uh, during the climate uh, action summit in 2019, a coalition of donors provided strong support to a strengthened CJIR uh, climate change agenda, but also a redesign uh, of the current 
uh, work we have. So at the same time, <clears throat> the CJR went through a reform process, as many of you may know. And uh, in October 2020, we formed the one CGIAR, which means uh, all the agricultural research, international agricultural research institutes come under one umbrella. We share uh, certain services uh, and pool some of the funding. Uh, and this new uh, approach, this new framework will start in 2022. So currently, <clears throat> we are finalizing the research agenda of the one CGIAR. Uh, where we expect that the 2DI will be one core initiative. Now, what is the 2DI? What are we going to do? We, uh, are, uh, have, we have eight uh, sub-programs or regional challenges. Um, four of them, as you see, uh, are located in Africa, two in Latin America, and then the, uh, I'm coordinating together with my colleagues from Guinea and World Fish, the program on securing the Asian mega deltas, uh, the one in Asia, but also the fisheries uh, program uh, will be located in Asia. We went through a stakeholder engagement process uh, between June and August uh, last year, where we had a number of uh, events and uh, talked with 168 participants from different countries and organizations. Uh, and what we did is really collect um, feedback and input from stakeholders into the program, telling us why, where should be our focus, what should we consider. Um, and we had, um, so we had three uh, regional uh, consultations with uh, on our um, three sites, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, and the Ganges Delta. We also uh, used the stakeholder engagement to co-create a joint vision for the Asian mega deltas, <clears throat> which is transforming the region's mega deltas into sustainable food baskets and resilient and inclusive agricultural and aquacultural landscapes with low emission supply chains. And what you see on the next slide is uh, the general 2DI framework uh, that basically connected all the regional challenges. So we have uh, a part of uh, climate smart innovations. Uh, we have uh, a theme on uh, climate information advisory services, supporting policies and institutional reforms. And then we have three more cross-cutting themes on uh, empowerment of marginalized groups, women and youth, low emission supply chains, and uh, sustainable finance. And during the stakeholder engagement, uh, we talked about the different themes and then filled them uh, with more detail. So for example, <clears throat> technologies and practices uh, are very important, have been mentioned many times and will also remain very important in our uh, future research. But what came across is that we um, should apply more bottom up or locally led uh, research approaches uh, and should focus uh, more on uptake of technologies and practices uh, and see why some of the unsustainable ones still uh, are being applied. Then <clears throat> uh, information and knowledge management was an important point that came through uh, in many of the uh, breakout groups, considering uh, local ownership and providing relevant uh, knowledge uh, to policy and decision makers. Empowerment uh, was strongly highlighted in, I think, all of the discussions uh, of the themes and will definitely uh, we will definitely put a, a stronger focus on inclusivity, but not, uh, and that came also clearly uh, across, not for the sake of it, uh, but with purpose. 
Um, private sector involvement uh, was mentioned many times, and we see that as very important if we want to reach scale. Uh, important here is to mention that we uh, want to include private sector from the start. Um, it was emphasized uh, to do that if we want to uh, have see uptake of our research outputs. <clears throat> and then interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary research approaches, and a coherent impact pathway. Uh, so, for example, a, a very clear research to development uh, to deployment pathway. And then uh, targeted reforms uh, that uh, need a clear understanding of uh, what uh, the needs on the ground are. And that's also something that we want to uh, discuss today. What are the priorities uh, of Delta dwellers? What are priorities of policymakers and development organizations? Do they meet? Where do they meet? Are there gaps? Uh, and how can we bridge these gaps? So with that, I uh, give back to Lily. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andy and, and Ale, for those presentations. Um, we're going to have a couple more sort of presentations and then maybe some time for questions before breakouts. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to, to Matthew McCartney from the International Water Management Institute. Thank you very much, Libby, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining this session. Um, as you've just heard, um, both the Asian Mega Deltas program of the CGIR and the Living Deltas Hub um, are looking for effective solutions to what are very complex programs. And as Andy said, that for these for solutions to be effective, they must be locally relevant. Um, and that means that both programs are key, an absolute priority of both programs is to engage oh, yeah. with, all, with all stakeholders. Um, and as, as um, Ole just said, I mean, the whole design of the program in, of the CJR is based on stakeholder input um, and, and their, the, the voice of stakeholders in designing the actual, the actual research program. But most importantly, um, we need to engage with those who are going to be most affected by the changes that are coming, by the, the drivers of change that are coming, and for whom the solutions that we want to find um, will be most relevant. Um, and that means that we need to understand both the issues and the challenges of people who actually live in the Delta, live, work in the Delta, and who are dependent on the natural resources of the Delta um, for their livelihoods and well-being. So that's fishers, farmers, and all those other people that, that live within, within the deltas. So both the Asian Mega Deltas program and, and the Living Hub um, program, Living Deltas Hub program, um, are what, as Ole said, are they're, they're purposefully inclusive. Um, and, and, and Delta dwellers are sent to the research programs. Um, and so what we'd like to do now, what we've done as, as just for, as a contribution to this, uh, to this, this, this um, seminar is to develop a short film um, where we ask people living within the deltas where we're working two very simple questions. Um, first, first of all, we asked them what is good about living where you do in the delta that you live? And the second question is what are the challenges of, of, of living in the delta that you live in? And so now we'd just like to show that video. It's just a five minute video, very short, um, to give us a flavor of what people actually living within the deltas um, think of as their priorities and issues um, for them in, in the deltas. So thank you very much. And Ian, I'd be grateful if you could just launch the, the video. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you think it's a good thing. 
জলবায়ু পরিবর্তনের কারণে বাপ দাদার ভিটে আর পেশা থাকতে হয়েছে অনেককেই হতে হয়েছে উৎপাসকে যেমন বাগেরহাটের বেলায় বালি প্রলয়ঙ্কারী এক ঘূর্ণিঝড় আইলা কয়েক বছর আগে কেড়ে নিয়েছে তার সব সর্বস্ব হারিয়ে শত মাইল দূরে খুলনার জয়পুর চরে জীবন যুদ্ধ এখন বেলায়েতের হঠাৎ করেই অভিবাসী হওয়া এরকম মানুষ এখন অনেক বাংলাদেশে গত এক দশকে কেবল উপকূলবর্তী এলাকাতেই বাস্তু হারা হয়েছে লাখো বাংলাদেশি ชาวเมืองนี่อะไรเนี่ยไอ้สิโอชาวเมืองนี่อะไรเนี่ยไอ้สิโอชาวเมืองนี่อะไรเนี่ยไอ้สิโอชาวเมืองนี่อะไรเ
Um, but we uh, will next invite uh, Michiko Katagami, apologies if I've, I've pronounced that wrong, um, from Asian Development Bank. Uh, she's the Principal Agriculture and Natural Resources Specialist. Um, and after that, then we'll just open for some, for some questions. Uh, so over to you. Thank you, Libby. Um, my name is Michiko Katagami. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm glad to be invited into this uh, interesting discussion. Um, I was given only a five minutes to introduce what ADB does in the Del Asian Delta, so I'm just jumping right, right, uh, right in. Um, ADB, all of the investment that we do, Climate investment is very, very important fundamental requirements together with this uh, core benefit of environment sustainability measures. Um, it's just uh, the starting from the, the corporate target levels and in, in our agri um, strategy 2030, we make it a mandate for the corporate for this each year, 75% of the approved project is gonna be including the invest climate investments. That is means that adaptation and mitigation. And also this uh, during the 2000, 19 to 2030, a total of the 80 billion, 80 billion climate investment would have to be made in our developing countries. And that's a really harsh target, we thought, but if we already achieved that in 2019, uh, 2018 is more than 6 billion in climate investment has been achieved. So we're on a track on that corporate target, but said apart from this target, in our sector investment, it's just so important that to address that climate risks for every aspect of agriculture, natural resources management investments. Should I use my... Um, maybe, sorry, I forgot to share that. Oops, something is not working. Sorry, I just do without the... <laughs> I don't know. We saw, I'm sorry. We saw your screen. We saw your screen. Saw yeah, we didn't see it. And, and <laughs> you didn't see it, but I didn't know. I didn't know. In my, in my yeah. screen, it was just weird. But anyway, I just skipped this one. Sorry. You can yeah. take a look take, later you, if you're you, interested. <laughs> um, you don't have to rush either. You have a bit more time because Pradeep didn't manage to come. So to really? Take... Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Let me try once again then. No problem. No, no rush. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's just so nerve wracking. Anything, all participants. What is this? No, sorry, it's it's just coming out of this advanced sharing options that I don't know. Do you have anybody who has got my copy who can share? Maybe not, right? I, anyway. I have, I have it here. Oli, do you wanna share? Sorry, <laughs> it's called partnership, yeah. collaboration. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, I thought it would be a little bit difficult because... Um, One second. Okay, thank you. No, where is it? Yeah, okay. that's the yes. thing. I, I couldn't find it, <laughs> sorry. Share the screen. There Great, you thank you. That's it. Um, do you want to go into the second slide if you can? Yeah, yes. We can uh, first slide. Okay. The second slide. Yeah, it, it takes it's a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it takes a while. Okay, okay. Well, I just I I was trying to put that sort of the 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 Delta investment that we have on, uh, ongoing one and also the plant one for the next year, just to give you the flavor and examples of what we do. What I wanted to discuss about is that, okay, so for agriculture, natural resources sector, 2019, um, both the, the mitigation and adaptation investment put together, we invested about 0.6 billion, I think it was in total. And I think we can do a lot more that the total of the investment of the climate investment ADB, there was six point something billion. And then in our, in the nature of the, the operation, claim our resilience of fundamental requirements. So we want to do a lot more of that adaptation. And also that we started picking up all the um, opportunities of mitigation investment. For example, most of the, the, the things that we do, for example, Mekong Delta and all the other Delta region is the, 
well, I mean, so our bread and butter investment is in irrigation facilities and to withstand the, some of this, uh, the dry spells and also the, the, some of the facilities is that they're developing into a flood control management. But uh, usually those investment, infrastructure investment that is embedded with the capacity building the local community institutions and everything is done in a sort of collaborative sort of a consultation basis because it's a water management, land management, building the climate, uh, the disaster responsiveness. It was all done by the, the in, under the name of this capacity building at the community level. So it's a lot of, of the investment that we do in a Delta region. Um, for the climate resilience building is all um, participatory and consultative sort of like that procedure. Primary example of that is in the, the Myanmar. Myanmar investment that we made, started making, it's 195 million, I think it was. It's for the community development. Uh, traditionally, we've been doing this uh, CDD, the community driven development approach to give the block grant for the many, many uh, communities and uh, that they are the one who's going to, to prioritize what they need and what they're going to do. And then it initially was only for the climate, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the infrastructure investment of their interest, but we added the climate resilience of measures were roughly about the diversification of this uh, agricultural activities or the rural livelihood, uh, even just a micro sort of uh, enterprising kind of things that, that would just, uh, make them sort of more resilient to the shocks that might come in. And uh, I, today I thought I would just go through the major part of this uh, climate resilience and building investments happening in Bangladesh. So Oli, if you can, can you slide, go to the next slide? That's the last one that I have. Um, in Bangladesh, we've been doing a lot of irrigation schemes and a flat control uh, investment for particularly for this infrastructure building. Because as we all know, this, that there's a really flat prone areas, but if you go to the micro spoke, uh, micro areas, those same area that suffer from a flood, it's uh, that also is uh, <laughs> affected by the drought in the summer. So um, there's again, the community-based, small community-based decision-making, institutional building, capacity building, live to live, um, livest food sort of options development, that kind of investment is happening. And that's gonna be the, the chunk of the investment part of this irrigation, uh, sorry, the uh, investment. And then lastly, we started increasing sort of like a try, try out the deployment of the digital solutions, technology deployment. One of the things we started doing in Bangladesh is the, uh, this is including for this irrigation agriculture, but also rainfield agriculture and the rural population in general, working with the University of uh, the Washington, all these tech people, but made it a nice, very simple devices, text messages and the weekly text messages go to the rural farmers. And it's simply, just one thing is by irrigation advisory, just simply say, um, you, your crop, in, in the Bangladesh case, we started with the rice, your rice has consumed such and such amount of water last week, and next week, you don't have any rain. So that's the precision sort of the weather forecast and it's coming in there. So you should irrigate one half finger of the water for your rice. That kind of a simple irrigation system, and it's, it's a back by this all sorts of sophisticated remote sensing uh, technology and a satellite. I used to be, it's a spin of this a NASA project. And then it's, it's working quite well in uh, Pakistan and India. And then some of the farmers started using for this, not for the irrigation per se, but it's a uh, um, disease presentation mon monitoring because the moisture levels of weather forecasting is so good that they get, they know what to focus on to what, what, you, what, what to watch out for. And um, that's how that we have found for the out of our expectation in India uh, for, among the potato farmers. And then also interesting thing, deployment of uh, the, the technology solution is also evolving in India. Uh, we, we started working with a rain, rain fed farmer who doesn't have much of the resources, but it's the information. Information really can build their resilience by just changing the date of a sowing date of the simple same, uh, peanut crops. And we are, we are doing that kind of interesting. Uh, this, is, this is beyond that, the Delta things, but it's, uh, we're so excited about um, interesting that technology or new in, innovative people are doing. And then we are really good at um, helping wonderful people, researchers, 
uh, community people, institutions, NGOs, all those people who has got the interesting ideas and help them upscale. And that's what we that's what we do. That's what we're good at. We're not really necessarily the innovative bunch, but as a, I think a lot of people argue that we we really value collaboration, partnerships right from the beginning for the climate resilience agenda, because that's I think it's a really essential things that we need to do. Well, I'll stop here, then I'll I can take any questions if you have any. Thank you. And thank you, Ole. Thank you very much, Rishiko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's thank a small you. partnership. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Andy. Some time for some questions. Um, if, if anybody has any, you can just unmute and ask them directly or, um, or put your hand up if, if, if you don't feel comfortable. Is there any questions? So whether that's for, for Andy, for, for Ole or for Michiko on the things that they've talked about so far. All's quiet on Zoom. <laughs> uh, Nobody has a question. I would have one. <laughs> Go ahead. Terry's got one. Okay. Terry, uh, maybe just unmuted himself. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. And apologies, I joined uh, late because I was doing some teaching. So Terry Cannon from the Institute of Development Studies in Britain. Um, my my concern is that uh, a number of things really need to be. Um, made clearer uh, for understanding. So in the film, there is just an assumption that some of these things are due to climate change um, and that uh, there's reference to there suddenly being um, a lot of migrants in, in Bangladesh. These things are not sudden and they're also not really related to climate change. So my comment or question, if you like, is to what extent is it useful to be framing this around climate change when all these problems in deltas or even the riverbank erosion or whatever have been going on for decades. And in, in Bangladesh, the data does not really show that the flooding has got any worse. Um, in the delta uh, region, it's possible the cyclones have got more intense, but there's no evidence that they're more frequent and there have been much worse cyclones in the 1960s. So the framing around climate change, of course, is, is good virtue signaling, but it's not very good science. And, and in relation to this, the, the way in which it's pitched in terms of the ADB uh, making investments in relation to um, climate change is fulfilling a need for organizations and governments to, to blame climate change for problems which they really ought to have taken responsibility for um, uh, many, many over a period of many, many years. And, and framing it around climate change, I'll finish uh, with this, it is also uh, ignoring the fact that in the Mekong, the major problem is subsidence and control, upstream control of the inflow of rivers, which is the salinization problem, to a lesser extent in the um, Ganges Brahmaputra. Um, and the problem of si uh, subsidence in these coasts, which was highlighted in the UN report a couple of weeks ago. And so long as we talk about this in relation to climate change, it's letting organizations and governments off the hook for things that they should have been fixing for years. And, um, and um, so, so I think this, that we really have to have a much more clear scientific approach to this um, if it's going to be guiding um, billions of dollars of spending. Very good comment. Can I... yep. Okay. Don't you go ahead and make it sure. Sorry, um, just for information, Terry. I mean, I your abs your argument is absolutely right. I think that's the, always the things that we always at internally discuss about among the ADB and also World Bank, the regional development banks. We have come up with a solution to just to for this administrative purposes of this: what is development investment and what is a climate investment, particularly in the area of adaptation. And there's a strict control if you ask me <laughs> to, to define what is adaptation, what is not. What we usually do is run the series of climate scenarios for our investment and then define the project directly relevant risks based on which only the 
incremental investment portion that respond directly to those identified localized risk is defined as adaptation. So we have a lot of uh, sort of intellectual exercise, although it's not evidence, it's a sort of estimation exercise that we do. And that's just uh, the, the we, we define as a, in the, the sort of the drawing a line between development investment and also the climate investment for the adaptation. And then the, for us in our portfolio, uh, you usually invest, decided a new investment of making a $2 billion a year. And then out of it, maybe up to like 14, 20% of that goes to the investment, climate investment, other than that's the, uh, the, the development investment to address all so many other things. So um, I think you're right in a sense that it's a, it's, it's a hype in a sense sort of this, there's a lot of climate fund is there and all the countries are applying for this and that, and then they, you would have to comply with what they require. But uh, I think fundamental sort of uh, the science-based science -based sort of approach and also these requirements to look at the, something beyond the climate risk, that's, that's, fun, that's absolutely right. And then the, actually, uh, we would like to seek your guidance and we, how we can improve. Actually, that's that's the, the kind of the discussion that we've been having from, since the late last year. Thanks. Can I also give a quick comment? I uh, do not fully agree with you, uh, Terry, but partially agree. So I think we have to uh, clearly see uh, that climate change is not the only reason, but part of the reason. So we see, of course, for example, a sea level rise, and we see also land subsidence. The sea level rise we can attribute to climate change, lands, land subsidence is rather due to um, human interaction. Uh, we also uh, see very different water flows, for example, in the Mekong, partly because uh, of dam construction, partly because of uh, more uh, extreme weather events. Uh, we see, for example, and in your La Nina events, seem, there's evidence that it is, becomes more frequent. So there is, uh, we cannot blame climate change on everything, that's for sure. But it makes uh, the complex problem much worse. Uh, I'll just come in and, f and finish the triumvirate. <laughs> Again, not to rebuff you in that sense, I, I agree with a lot of what you say. I mean, Climate changes effects are not linear, though. I would I would sort of echo Ole's statement. You know, you know, if you get, if you get a, you know, some some people attest that if you get ten percent more rainfall, you get thirty percent higher flows. Ten percent less, you get thirty percent worse droughts. I mean, whether or not that's true everywhere, um, but the, the effects are not linear. But in in relation to what we're doing, uh, in and the the immediate uh, aspect of what you're talking about. A large part of what we're doing is, is trying to bring to bear, the, for example, the arts and humanities oral histories to, to examining Delta change, as well as, uh, you know, what people might call science in terms of paleolimnology to look at uh, coring deltas to get that long term story to give the better context of change. Um, but what we know in the Anthropocene is that things are accelerating. It's not called the great acceleration for, for nothing. In that sense, and and, and the, the 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 rate of that trajectory and the timescales to adapt are getting more immediate. That's the, that's the problem. I agree. Governments can't sort of um, hide behind climate change, and the SDG VNRs are one way of doing that. And, and one one approach that we need to talk about is how we localize uh, adaptation or localize um, uh, action in terms of, for example, localizing the SDGs, and all of that requires conversations new conversations with with funders and, and the policy drivers so for example with the the adb in terms of how they can produce you know better bring better to bear the the investment potential to to have the big, bigger impact but I, I don't want to go on too much more because i'm sure we can explore these in the breakout rooms terry did you want to come back mm -hmm. Uh, just to briefly say, yes, of course, climate change is going to be the, the, the magnifier of these problems. What I'm, what I'm wanting to look at is actually apportioning some kind of attribution to the existing political economy that has created the problems of hunger, vulnerability, and, and so on. So climate change, of course, is uh, and sea level rise from uh, global warming is going to magnify all of those problems. But there's no point analyzing this in, in terms of climate change only. So why are people hungry? 
uh, and the, and the interventions, uh, the uh, interventions may well be good, but if you make investments that deal with flooding or irrigation, by definition, in, it, that is mainly aimed at people who have got land. So the problem of poverty and vulnerability in Bangladesh is that um, at least 30% of the people are landless, and around 70 to 80% of the people have are either landless or have marginal land holdings. So in, in the work I've been trying to do on um, local level adaptation in Bangladesh um, in, in the years, working with NGOs and so on, those are the people who tend to be neglected and it's extremely difficult to do a, um, an irrigation or a flood control measure, which in, actually involves them because the, the, by definition, they are not um, a party to something which affects land. They are primarily landless laboring households who of course migrate seasonally when they have to. So what, what I'm worried about is that so the solutions, the supposed solutions that are looked at are those which organizations can carry out, but they're not actually necessarily what people need because you can only do what the organization can do. And the land tenure issue in Bangladesh or most of Asia is something which can only be affected by, by the government um, uh, in terms of land changes to that, as happened in Taiwan and South Korea in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Um, and, and so what I'm concerned about is that the things that are going on are designed around what the organization can do rather than what is needed. I think that probably go ahead. No, very good point. Thank you very much, Terry. And please stay with us uh, in the breakout groups, but uh, also then in the in the following plenary discussions. I think we have to now move to the breakout groups, Libby. I was just going to say almost the same thing. So we're now going to move into into two breakout groups, um, and we'll have about twenty five minutes to discuss the different, uh, partly following on exactly from what Terry was, was saying, the sort of different priorities of different stakeholders on the deltas. Um, each, each group will have its own chair, so we can go into the questions in more detail during the sessions. We'll also be using something called Padlet to um, take the notes, so that we'll, we'll share that with, with each group to make sure that that's recorded. So I'm gonna to go to Samaya now to hopefully magic us into two breakout sessions. Um, and we'll take it from there and then we'll see everybody back here uh, at about 25 past the hour. Uh, dear participants, we will be now moving to our breakout rooms. For a moment, you might feel like uh, you have been logged out of the session, but if you are not, you are still in the session, you will be just taken to a different window. Uh, okay.
thank you so much. I think that worked out, no? Can you put Ian in one of the breakouts? And I think everybody else has allocated them. Uh, he is already assigned to the breakout room too. He has not yet joined, in fact. Um, I think there's another participant that's out. But I think everybody else is everywhere. Just double check that um, Esam and Catherine are in one and Jonathan and Libby are in another. Yes, Esam and It would be Assam and Catherine, or Jonathan and Libby in Assam and Catherine room one, Jonathan and Libby room two. Yeah, John is in room two, Libby is in room two as uh, room okay. two as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there is another participant. Can I just look at the other Garrett? Ian Garrett, he has not yet joined, but uh, he no, is assigned. There is another one, Agdom Nita, uh, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Ian's gone, and I think uh, this is one more participant, but then otherwise we're good. Thank you, thank you. I think that worked out seamlessly. Yeah, it looks like it did. You did assign two people and then automatically assign them? No, you did assign two people and then you did it manually. Manually? Or just you open the rooms and let go? No, you did it manually. You did it manually. You did it manually. You did it manually. You did it I think it's a time kill. Now, I'm going to go to the time kill. We just around 40 participants. So, I'm going to go to the room. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to go to the I've assigned Jen and Adnan into rooms and Sohail into different rooms. And then, it should just keep doing it. I, I remember when we did the youth one. But uh, you're right. Maybe last moment they can call him with the not test for it. I'm going to just try run him with the test for it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. We were very much mid discussion when we were catapulted back in here. So um, I hope the other group was also having um, a good and interesting discussion. Uh, so now we have some time to, so the two groups were discussing different things. Um, one was focusing more on the um, sort of Delta dwellers uh, opinions or kind of our, what we might think that might be their priorities. Um, and the other group was focusing more on policymakers. Um, so now we're gonna have some time um, really to feedback from the sessions, to discuss about the sessions um, and to see where the, the overlaps might be. So I'm gonna pass back to, to Ole to chair this next bit. Is he back? There we go. Thank you, Libby. Yeah, you said it. Uh, we wanna bring both groups together. And I think as a start, I would uh, like to ask one person from each group to quickly report back to the other group what were the main points that have been discussed in not more than five minutes, rather two to three, please. From group one, who would like to start? So Katie, do you want to do this or? Or should I do it? Uh, is this for the recap? Yeah. Uh, okay, I will just go through a few of the things that were said. Um, mainly, um, I think we focused a lot on um, understanding who the target audience is. So actually being able to define what we mean by Delta dwellers. And um, then there were also some comments about understanding um, the cultural heritage and how this has changed over time. Um, and to look at what nature-based uh, approaches have been used in the past and how that has uh, led to change or resilience to natural shocks that have happened already. Um, also to take an intergenerational approach that recognizes um, different priorities between younger and older generations. And um, yeah, to focus on maybe the value of other inputs and that livelihoods are not just made up of, uh, of a job. Um, let's see. I think it was also mentioned um, that the core population and communities that would be the focus are those that are marginalized um, the most in the deltas, so the most vulnerable and poor communities of both fishermen and uh, farmers, and to try to um, then also generate livelihood opportunities and jobs uh, in the future for, for these communities based on what they want that to look like. Uh, I think that mainly covers it. We also discussed about how changes in um, sediment supply need to be addressed, um, but it wasn't exactly clear on, on what the resilience or oriented um, strategies and priorities should be around that. Um, so yeah, I think that covers our session for the most part. If anybody else would like to make any comments, please do so. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. I think you've done an excellent job there. It, just to complement what Katie just said exactly, I mean, we, the, the conversation started about, you know, what we mean by the dwellers or the people, you know, who are these? And, and I think there was a, a natural tendency that, you know, we all sort of, you know, we, uh, we, we said, you know, it's, it should focus on those vulnerable, you know, those far furthest behind, you know, you know all those uh, similar objectives. And then when we talk about interventions, then the point was the focus should be on the systemic um, uh, constraints as opposed to just reducing it to livelihood options, et cetera. But looking at, you know, be it financial inclusion, exclusion, there's uh, institutional bias or, you know, a number of other uh, uh, systemic constraints that they face. So looking at, you know, using that systems thinking uh, uh, to identify those uh, intervention priorities was emphasized. Um, and the other one was just to complement to that as well is sort of you know, shift, shifting away from this top down paternalistic approach to more, uh, towards more sort of a bottom approach, which is, I think, exemplary of uh, the examples that we saw with the GDI and the Delta Hub today. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, SM and Katie from group one, uh, reporting back on uh, the priorities for Delta dwellers. Can I ask uh, 
someone from group two to report back, please. I'm happy to make a start and then see if, if others want to, to jump in. So we were having a discussion around priorities for, for policymakers. Um, I, I think there's sort of one important thing that was that was said was that sort of, um, this, this was a, a quote from, from Terry Cannon who said that the world is the way it is because those who have power want it to be this way. And I think that is probably key in, in everything else that, that we talked about um, in terms of, uh, there was a discussion around the the unequal distribution of, of um, resources and of water, so particularly between India and Bangladesh and the, the problems that can, can cause, but also to do with the erosion of financial resources that are available, um, why are resources not getting to where they need to be, um, and how can we influence that. We did have sort of some positive discussions reminding ourselves that change is possible um, if we provide the right kind of evidence and that it's important from the perspective of initiatives like Living Delta Hub and 2GI, um, that we have to identify what will actually work and really um, display that to, to policymakers and something that will actually lead to change. Uh, we didn't have time to discuss it, but there was a point uh, made at the end of our session um, around the, the Mekong and that there is often really a, a top-down approach and that people making those decisions often aren't listening to and the people living on the Delta. And so that's really where change can come. I think they're the main things that, that we just covered. John, I don't know whether you have uh, some additional things or anybody else from our session. No, I'd be very happy for anyone, any of the participants actually to add Libby to what you've said, some of those who perhaps didn't have the opportunity to voice um, to, 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 to voice anything during the meeting, uh, during our breakout group. So then, I mean, uh, to everybody listening to what we have just heard from the two groups or also what we uh, think ourselves, what are the commonalities of the priorities and what are the gaps? Is there, are the priorities aligned? And I please think, just unmute yourself if you, if I, you want to. I think there's a challenge in trying to unpick Terry's quote um, to try and get less top down and more bottom up. Now, even with the you know, the quote from Anne on the Vietnamese situation, you know, that, that there's a degree of comfort, I think, in some communities, uh, it's been expressed by some of our researchers that they quite like a one party state because they're told what to do and then the, 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 the income comes from that. If they're told three crops of rice versus two, um, that's okay, you know, but that's, that, that's just accepting the world as the way it is. I think we need to sort of try and have a conversation across a range of sectors. Um, in the language that each of those understand in terms of what are the potential opportunities to, to break that quote. Um, and I think in that case, what was mentioned in group one, the, um, the generational aspect, I think, is a really key one. Um, youth and marginalized communities, gender are, are, are key areas where we, you know, we need to be trying to make inroads, a very difficult ones to do in terms of, for example, maybe gender, but youth it's undeniable that the population, you know, um, uh, pyramids are changing in terms of the, the youth and, uh, and also the potential more out outrage that the younger generation would feel at that quote. Um, I, I, I don't deny that quote. I mean, it's, it's, it's undeniable. But, you know, now we're get, I think we're approaching a phase where potentially there might be more traction for youth action. Um, and, and, and therefore their, their priorities should be, should be uh, sought as soon as we can. Thank you, Andy. Comments directly on what Andy has said. Does everybody agree? If not, maybe let me pose two provocative questions. 
that may uh, provoke some <clears throat> some answers. That, so obviously, uh, developing countries want to develop. So uh, and one of the key aspects is economic development. So the question, my question uh, would be: um, that is is the degradation of the deltas and inevitable trade-off of economic development of the regions? I think Ole, um, you've definitely provoked me to say something here. So <laughs> I think that um, uh, I personally, uh, sorry, I'm not going to take much time, but just to say quickly that um, uh, I, I always argue that that's a, sort of a, a false dichotomy. It's just about you know the misconception of how we perceive the natural capital, the environment. Uh, if I always argue in favor of seeing the natural capital, the environment, or the ecosystem, uh, you know, as a as a as a natural capital, as it's as a capital base, as an asset for you know as an economic infrastructure, if you like, you know, as much as we see in you know, the bridges and roads and. Uh, a number of other infrastructures, you know, if we were to see the natural environment and ecosystems in through that lens, and we see them as, as a capital, and we wouldn't have that sort of discussion because, you know, you wouldn't damage your um, factory that produces cars, for instance, you know, or, you know, so essentially, or you wouldn't damage your bridges because, you know, uh, I don't know, you know what I mean? So I think the point being that, you know, it's just sort of a shift in mentality that's very key here, the perception, the attitude, and the way we see and value the natural environment. And I think we, I, I always use that expression. I, I always say we need to see the natural ecosystem, the natural environment as an economic, as an economic infrastructure. And therefore, I, I don't think any kind of trade-off would make any financial or economic sense at all. But that's that's. I mean, I'm an environmental economist, so definitely biased. So it would be nice to hear um, reactions from others. I see uh, Terry would like to provide a reaction to that. Please. Thanks very much. I, I don't want to speak if somebody else wants to speak. So, but uh, I will have to go shortly to go and teach a class. Um, so I'll just say this first. I think this issue of the trade-off in the um, what is happening in, in deltas is the fact that rice is grown in these deltas is is a trade-off. We didn't call it economic development in the days when the first people settled in those deltas to grow rice. But in in the Ganges Brahmaputra, it's probably less uh, less than 300 years that people have been growing rice in that delta, um, and we have to again be scientifically precise about the idea as to what is natural. And these deltas are, there's basically nothing natural left in them uh, once we have human occupants. So a, a typical trade-off in, in both the, the Mekong and the, and the um, Ganges Brahmaputra is the trade-off between rice production and shrimp um, cultivation. And we know that what, what we call the, these um, crops, if, if you like, these outputs, are determined by different um, classes of people. So they, the, the classes of people who have the ability to concrete off areas in um, near Kulna is a different class of people than those who are wage laborers who, who survive by day labor on other people's fields and the smallholders whose land is, is tainted by the salinity that escapes from the shrimp ponds. So, so there are different categories of people and interest groups, some having more power than others, who are influencing the way in the deltas go. And, and as was hinted at by Andy, in, in uh, Vietnam, you would have a one-party state that has a very strong influence over what happens. So I, I worry about the use of ecosystems and ecosystem services and naturally-based solutions in the sense that the, the the main um, biological component of all these systems is, is humans. And we can't separate ourselves off from the so-called ecosystem as if we are not part of that ecosystem. But our participation in those ecosystems um, is, is determined by the systems of power which operate and determine how they want to operate. And when I talk about the world is the way it is because those who have power want it that way, I don't mean some super 
corporations or specific governments that can operate down to the landlord level in um, in, in in Bangladesh or India or whatever. So it 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 it's it's actually who who has the ability to control how people live, and these voices that we want from the Dells is absolutely um, wonderful. And what I I would like to propose, I have done in a few few places, and I'll finish on this is to propose a, a global Delta People's Solidarity Network, um, which would actually link up people so they talk to each other. We tried it with this conference to have, because we're in a project that is in both West Bengal and Bangladesh side of the Sundarbans, and we were going to try to get people to video, make videos and talk to each other across the international border. We, because of COVID, we didn't manage that. But the idea would be to have people in the Louisiana Delta of the Mississippi, talking to people in Bangladesh about their common problems and having voice in that sense. And I think this would, the, the thing to get a greater voice from the Deltas would be to have an international collaboration where these people are brought together to hold governments and researchers to account um, on what is actually done, is it for their benefit? Um, I'll stop there in, in a few minutes. I, I, I won't run away because people might want to challenge on that but I will have to go in, in um, 10 minutes and apologies for that. Okay. We also just have 10 minutes for this session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the input and, and uh, the suggestion, the proposal. Uh, does anybody want to uh, respond to that? I think it's a great idea. <clears throat> And um, maybe we can get the ADB and the World Bank and UNDP to fund it. I think it needs a big push from a del big deltas collective, like involving everybody in the room, but big organizations like us to, to do that. But I, I think it's a real, you know, we often talk, we're, we're being approached in our university. What happens after living deltas in five years' time? In other words, selfish old our university in the global north going well will you get another project and my response to them is if it is it's got to be led by the global south partners because that's how the legacy of this project would work um, we need to get more voices and um, but it should be funded by the people with the resources you know which is the the big organizations i'll stop because i've talked quite a lot today let, let, let anybody else come in i think that uh, whatever uh solidarity we can think about globally it has to have a grassroots linkage uh, so it should, should primarily be led by uh, the empowered uh, grassroots otherwise you know as you said that uh, with the with the project and funding change there be nothing left uh, uh, so is 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 a greater uh, you know democratization of the rights exercises and solidarity among the grassroots that can actually link with any international uh, forums as well that can strengthen this uh, exchange of voices and solidarity uh, regionally internationally thanks Thank you. Any other comments uh, on the idea of uh, Delta Solidarity Movement? Uh, hello. Yes, please. I, I just want to follow the idea by tell, uh, Terry about um, developing the coalition, global coalition for the entire people. And my uh, my insights from Vietnam, you know, and a so-called authoritarian state, um, uh, the point is that the, the, the ruling party in Vietnam, they never like the idea of collective action. They never like the idea of grassroots movements, you know, with the, and connecting with the global networks. It is quite sensitive for the ruling party in Vietnam. So when we talk about collective action at the global level, transnational level, and we need to very we need to be very attentive to the political landscape. And somehow that kind of coalition maybe is very great, but 
but we need to be very careful otherwise we will put the local people the delta dwellers into you know, at risk you know in confronting with the ruling parties with the local governments with the national government um because they they, they never like the idea anything networking anything collective action you know at uh, local level national level transnational level it it's not a you know they, they never interested in that and they try to you know to block right from the beginning if they think that action can cause some kind of risk to the regime survivor so um when do you design or when we develop the idea or uh, raise a more movement about um collective action at the global level i think we need to be very attentive to the local context especially at the you know to the politics of the of the local level and so that to avoid the risk for the local people and that's a very uh, small point that i want to add to terry but i'm very interested in in this initiative and um, i will email you terry and Thank you, Angu, for your comment. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you were done or if you were breaking up, uh, but I see Shoban also raising her hand, please. Yeah, I guess just to carry on from this idea is just to kind of remember the importance of um, generating openness, generating those spaces and an openness to listening to those voices and maybe a little naive and it definitely needs careful attention to power but kind of um, thinking through where some of the commonalities or opportunities for collaboration between those who live in the de Delta and policymakers are and trying to kind of find ways to yeah, bridge those gaps um, you know I've been thinking that you know lots of lots of those policymakers will also live in those deltas and will also have their own personal concerns and hopes and fears for the, those, their local ecology, which may not be always drastically different to the, those shared by the poor and marginalized. So I don't want to kind of um, assume that the kind of, that the issues of power that Terry Ray, Terry's raising are not there, but also in parallel to look at places where we can, um, opportunities to bridge some of those gaps, I guess. And how could we bridge those gaps or can you define the gaps uh, a bit more in detail? Um, I, get, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking on my feet and developing ideas, but I think we often think that we have to talk to the poor and marginalized to find out how they feel and what their priorities are. And sometimes I think what happened if we turned our attention to policymakers and not just always see and, and ask them similar sets of questions and see if we we arrive at similar places. Um, and then I guess, you know, careful facilitated interaction between representatives of different groups um, that is really thought through and carefully designed to allow equal participation and openness to one another's ideas. Yeah, so those are kind of uh, round table discussions with different stakeholders? Mm, no, I, I think kind of even more careful and creative, maybe using some kind of concepts from human centered design to get people from different positions, answering, um, coming up with solutions together or kind of identifying, um, answering provocative state, posing provocative questions to people from different positions. Um, but yeah, more kind of creative, interactive, participatory approaches. Okay, thank you, thank you. I see Michael Streckler uh, has unmuted himself. Yes, I was just, um, as an additional comment, is that um, one thing, you know, I've heard in, in terms of talking to people with, you know, a round table with the farmers and policymakers or leaders, is that if you talk to them separately or with the presence of the local leaders, you will get different answers that you have to be very careful about how you structure the conversations um, if you want to actually get accurate answers. 
Yeah, definitely. But I think these things can happen in a series of conversations. So you may have conversations with different groups, but you can also kind of structure a shared session carefully. Um, so could uh, this approach uh, of, of uh, facilitated series of uh, discussions and listening uh, to other sides be a uh, an alternative to a kind of grassroots riot that was proposed earlier <laughs> I, I kind of see the two things happening in parallel and i didn't think terry was proposing a riot <laughs> of course i'm i'm again being provocative um we have about one to two, maybe three minutes left for other ideas, comments, uh, and then uh, we move to our last section. Can, can I suggest that you and I just carry on co-chairing, uh, Ole, and my, my last se session was what we take forward towards COP26. I think if we just drop that into the mix, because as I say, we've got 10 minutes and we can't go over that slot because of the conference. Um, then we'll just sort of see if people want to feed in things that we should be thinking about as we want to take them to a larger forum for discussion and how we can maybe maybe think of doing that. One thing that we were obviously thinking about is as we join together as the Deltas Collective with, with the Living Deltas Hub and we should, you know, um, Del Mega Deltas, that that's, you know, bigging up, increasing our impact and our presence and, and the range of things we cover and the range of deltas we cover. But I'm certainly, you know, Terry's probably gone now, but well, he's still there. But, uh, you know, how do we get in touch with Louisiana, for example, in the Mississippi? You know, how do we, how do we, how do we broaden that discussion as we go towards COP? And given that it's probably virtual, how do we, you know, how do we get an impact on a, in a, in a Zoom-oriented world in, in November? And, and a voice for deltas, and particularly a voice for the more marginalized. Well, uh, I put a dampener on discussions, didn't it? <laughs> well, what, one thing we are thinking of doing, you know, uh, we, we've, uh, because Living Deltas is funded by UKRI, UK Research and Innovation under their Global Challenges Research Fund, and the, the changing world of the UK economy now after Brexit and all sorts of stuff and COVID, you know, they're, they're keen on on developing links with it, with the governments and and uh, aspects of the foreign and commonwealth development office as it is now so that's one mechanism by which we can do it but we want to maintain a sort of independence of our message at the same time in in terms of what we want to sort of push push forward for cop so i just wonder if anybody's got any thoughts as to what they'd like to see in that the sort of range of discussions Yeah, anything people would like to see or anything people would add, uh, which links to uh, the deltas, which is being uh, discussed in regards to COP? Any other initiatives? Is it too much about deltas? Should we forget about deltas at all because nobody listens? I do like this idea of the global Delta People Solidarity Network. We might have to call it something different. I think Terry's aware, aware of that in the in the chat. I think we need to avoid activism and action in the title of that. Um, conversation is probably the word. Maybe a global conversation, global Delta conversation, might be a simple way of sort of um, treading softly into the world of um, where people like things as they are, and fund it that way to keep it as it is. Um, just softly, softly, just sort of exploring conversations might be the way forward. Do people feel that the SDGs are the right vehicle for that? Um, I was told in, in, when I con contributed to a book back in 2011, 10 years ago, goodness, now, on um, 
ecosystem services in the UK that if, if, uh, at the launch of the book, which then was followed a week later by some very innovative government policy, and was said there was the fastest translation of science into policy in the UK at that point. Um, the point was made that if you use the word ecosystem services, half the people don't know what you're talking about. And uh, what nature does for us is probably the better story. How do we get that, that language going along with the conversation uh, to, to get our messages across? Hi, Andy, this is not um, a response to your question, but maybe to all uh, or to your earlier question about what should we do in in the COP. So I was wondering, during the Fiji uh, presidency, the, the, the Fijians introduced this Talanoa dialogue. So it's a platform wherein different stakeholders will just come up and and present ideas. I was I wonder whether there would be like a similar Delta dialogue or something like that, wherein there's a platform for Delta stakeholders, Delta dwellers, or anyone from, from the Delta to speak about the concerns within their particular Delta. And then there would be like a, a proper venue and a proper you know forum for that so that different stakeholders could come. Because I thought the, the Talanoa framework during the Fiji presidency really worked well. And I think it was well appreciated. Would you Quickly elaborate. Sorry. Sorry, there we go. Echoes. <laughs> the, the Fiji issue uh, or initiative, how did that work? So basically, they had this platform in one of the uh, pavilions. They call it the Tala. So they, they have also this formal approach, which in Talanoa is something like an informal conversation, I think. But they also created like a, a separate platform wherein different partners would come in and talk about climate change issues. And then they've set it up in a way that it's like a, a forum wherein um, stakeholders would, would, of course, they have to book their time and then set like what are the topics they need to discuss. But it's being in, advertised as, OK, this is one of the Talanoa dialogue. And I think in, the, in, 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 in Fijian society, it's like they, they sit around together, around stones or around rocks or something like that and talk about issues. So that's the, the same uh, setup that they've adapted uh, in Bonn at some point. And I thought it, it worked because it really engages uh, people to talk about issues in, in a sort of, in, in a less formal way. So I wonder what there would be like a more, a Delta dialogue, for example, that will bring in different uh, uh, stakeholders from the different Delta and then we facilitate that process and we enable a platform whether it would lead to the similar outcome as well. I don't know, or maybe there's a particular term used in the Delta in the same manner that we have the Gobeshona conference, for example, whether there would be a unique Delta term to describe, to describe such kind of an approach. Yeah, I think that's really good. I'm just quickly mindful of time. Siobhan said, how about a poetry, a film collaboration? I was thinking of something as in parallel, I think in time as Siobhan was thinking about, was, was um, these community initiatives in American cities, you know, like Detroit, which are really on their, on their last legs, you know, where, where people could just come together and, and, and tout ideas and the, the, the winning idea gets $200 or something, I think is surprised. But it gets some chance to maybe do something. I'm not talking about, you know, there's an issue there about how we would reward, you know, whether we have a competition, you know, for, for ideas, for, for better deltas and how that's driven from community. And maybe we can, you know, have a, have a you get those projects underway and things. Maybe there's, there's a range of, it'd be nice to have these conversations regularly as, you know, in the next couple of months uh, to develop, you know, this, this idea towards COP. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a really, Solid idea. So, um, Siobhan, did you want to elaborate on your film competition or anything like that? Your media fellowship um, things. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I, um, I encourage you all to have a look at the the link I shared, and just I think I mean it goes back to something I said earlier. I think we have to remember that decision makers are emotional human beings as well, and perhaps sometimes they you know, we can make an influence change. Um, beyond scientific evidence and PowerPoint presentations um, and roundtables and conferences, and that maybe something shared which uh, 
finds a, a creative and appropriate delta appropriate ways to get a, a diverse group of people who live in deltas to share some of the their values and ideas of the future for deltas um, and perhaps you know managed by the different organizations presented here so it would be relate to some of your uh, research areas but produce a more accessible and engaging output to really put deltas on the map um, in the run up to COP26 and beyond. Mm -hmm. It could run alongside a series of media fellowships, which would provide kind of an, a, you know some of the information that might be missing from a shorter, more artistic output. Yeah, yeah thank you. We're, we're writing everything down and noting your comments very good contributions uh, i see michael you unmuted yourself if you want to comment yeah i mean it's, i think i don't know much about the cop process i've not been in, in in involved but i would certainly think that you know deltas as a particularly vulnerable area due to you know subsidence that enhances the sea level rise and the sediment supply and climate change um could certainly be you know a, a an interesting component the same way like small island nations have you know have brought themselves to the fore that delt places with deltas can be a, a, a significant focus and and that would be a really good thing because they, they really are some of the most vulnerable places on earth i'm mindful of time i think we're in our last um, minute and I think that's probably the statement on which we should probably end because it's pretty profound. Um, they are the most vulnerable places on earth. I think they're in the front line of a lot of things. Um, and the people who are at that front line are at the back end often of a lot of, um, of, of initiatives. So we aim to do that. We'll hopefully keep these conversations going over the next few months. Please feel free to contact either of the, our two initiatives, Ole at the and colleagues at the uh, 2DI uh, Mega Deltas Initiative uh, and ourselves and the Living Deltas were only too pleased to carry on conversations and receive ideas because despite our sizes, we um, need bigger communities to make this work. Ollie, do you want to say anything? But thank you very much from myself and uh, enjoy the rest of Goveshina. I think that was uh, a perfect closing remark. I can only echo, please uh, contact us. I'm sure that uh, you have our uh, email addresses, so we're happy for any more suggestions uh, and also critical comments. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, Libby.